It's going to be, it's going to make a remarkable difference in your life if you're ready to receive. So we're going to pray that God will open up your heart, that will plant a, his word in your heart, that it will grow deeper and stronger in Jesus Christ. Amen. And we thank you for Uncle Albie in the back. He's going to be playing some, some accompanying music that will get, really get your heart in the right position. You guys ready? Yes. Okay. Let's pray first. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we come before you. We ask you to scrub our hearts today. Scrub it clean. Let the word of God just penetrate the deepest parts of our heart. Wherever there is a, a wall, Father, we ask you to break it down. If there are people are offended today, Father, we break that today. If people are ill today, in the name of Jesus Christ, West for total healing. If there's a financial need, Father, you are our provider because with Christ all things are possible. Would you help us just to believe, to trust you, the author and finisher of our faith? And everyone said in Jesus' name, Amen. As I was preparing for the message, I had something entirely different. But God put something on my heart that uh, every year I go through this writing by Robert Boyd Munger. It's called My Heart, Christ's Home. I have to go back to the fundamentals of my Christianity. Amen? Sometimes we get so complicated. Sometimes we get so pressed. Sometimes we have so much junk in our lives that we've got to remove the stuff in our life. Glenn was saying that uh, their house is being under construction. Now he has to remove all some, some of the junk in his room. Get so much stuff inside, so he's giving things away, I guess. Violet can hear a hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. He's not looking at you. He's not looking at you. <laughs> but we've got to get rid of some of the things. How many of you get stuff in your life you just got to get rid of? Okay, you just have it there just to have it there. And, and it just takes up space and takes up time. And it takes just too much attention away from what is necessary in your life. Amen? Amen? So God has called you all the way back into the fundamental fundamental principles of our of our Christianity. It's called my heart Christ home. And you'll see in your notes, if you have I'm gonna just between every every room, I'm gonna take just a slight pause so you can write maybe a note or two, maybe a word, a thought in it. For those of you who don't like like to take notes take notes anyway and the reason for that it is so important that when you go back then God will ask God to jot something down in your in your heart and God is going to touch you in a very special way today some of you will have a breakthrough today Amen. can I hear on below hallelujah praise God some of you will not why I don't know you have to figure that out but the word of God will penetrate your heart and God loves brokenness. But let God put you back together again. Amen? Amen. So, I like, you know, He's going to put you in a potter's house. He's going to reshape you, reshape your heart so that it will be something new for His purposes. John 14, 23 and 24 says, Jesus replied, All who love me will do what I say. My Father will love them and will come and make our home with each of them. Anyone who does, doesn't love me will not obey me. And remember my words are not my own. What I'm telling you is from the Father who sent me. This is directly from our Heavenly Father. One evening that I shall never forget, I invited him into my heart. What an entrance he made. It wasn't spectacular or emotional, but very real. It was at the very center of my life. He came into the darkness of my heart and turned a light on. He built a fire in the cold hearth and banished the chill. He started music where there had been stillness and filled the emptiness with his wonderful, wonderful, loving fellowship. I've never regretted opening the door to Christ and I never will, not into eternity. This of course is a first step 
in making the heart, my heart, Christ's home. He said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hears my voice and open the door, I will come to, into him and sup with him and he with me. Revelation 3.20 If you're interested in making your life an abode for, for the living God, let me encourage you to invite Christ into your heart and he will surely come. After Christ entered my heart, and in, and in the joy of this newfound relationship, I said to him, Lord, I want this heart of mine to be yours. I want to have you settle down here and be perfectly at home. Everything I have belongs to you. Let me show you around and introduce you to the various features of the home that you may be more comfortable and that we may have fuller relationship together. He was very glad to come, of course, and happier still to be given the place in my heart. The first room was a library. This first room was a study, the library. Let's call it, it is the study of the mind. Now in my home, this room of, of, in the mind is a very small room with very thick walls but it is a very important room. In a sense, it is the control room of my house. He entered with me, looked around at the books and the bookcases, the magazines upon the table, the pictures on the wall. As I followed his gaze, I became uncomfortable. Strangely enough, I had not felt badly about this before, but now that he was there looking at these things, I was embarrassed. There were some books before his eyes, but he was too pure to behold. There was a lot of trash and literature on the table that a Christian had no business reading. And for the pictures on the wall, the imaginations and the thoughts of my mind, these were shameful. I turned to him and said, Master, I know that this room needs a radical alteration. Will you help me make it? what it ought to be, to bring every thought into captivity to you. Surely, he said, gladly will I help you. That is one of the reasons I'm here. First of all, take all the things down that you're reading and seeing, which are not helpful, pure, good and true. Throw them out. Fill the library with scripture and meditate on the books of the Bible. Meditate on them day and night. For as the pictures on the wall, you will have difficulty controlling these images, but here is one aid. He gave me a full-size picture of himself. Hang this centrally, he said, on the wall of your mind. I did, and I have discovered through the years that when my thoughts are centered upon Christ himself, his purity and power cause impure imaginations to retreat. So he has helped me to bring my thoughts into captivity. May I suggest to you, if you have difficulty in this little room of the mind, that you bring it to Christ, pack it full of God's word, meditate upon it, and keep it before yourself. Joshua 1.8 says, study this book of instructions. Continually meditate on it day and night so you will be sure to obey everything written in it. Only then you will prosper and succeed in all you do. Jot something down. Heidi, the dining room. From the study, we went to the dining room, the room of appetites and desires. Now this was a very large room. I spent a good deal of time in the dining room and much effort in satisfying my wants. I said to him, this is a very commodious room and I am quite sure you will be pleased with what we serve here. He seated himself at the table with me and asked, what is on the menu for dinner? Well, I said, my favorite dishes, old bones, corn husks, sour cabbage, leeks, onions, and garlic right out of Egypt. There were the things I liked, worldly fare. 
I suppose there was nothing radically wrong in any particular item. But it was not the food that should satisfy the life of a real Christian. When the food was placed before him, he said nothing about it. However, I observed that he did not eat it. And I said to him, somewhat disturbed, Savior, you don't care for the food that is placed before you. What is the trouble? He answered, I have meat to eat that you know not of. My meat is to do the will of him that sent me. He looked at me again and said, If you want food that really satisfies you, seek the will of the Father, not your own pleasures, not your own desires, not your own satisfaction. Seek to please me, and that food will satisfy you. And there about the table, he gave me a taste of doing God's will. What a flavor. There is no food like it in all the world. It alone satisfies. Everything else is dissatisfying in the end. Now, if Christ is in your heart, and I trust he is, what kind of food are you serving him, and what kind of food are you eating yourself? Are you living for the lust of the flesh and pride of life selfishly? Or are you choosing God's will for your meat and drink? Psalms 34, 8. Taste and see that the Lord is good. All the joys of those who take refuge in him. Write something down. Lilia. The drawing room. He walked next into the drawing room. This room was rather intimate and comfortable. I liked it. It had a fireplace, overstuffed chairs, and a bookcase, sofa, and a quiet atmosphere. He also seemed pleased with it. He said, this is indeed a delightful room. Let us come here often. It is secluded and quiet, and we can have fellowship together. Well, naturally, as a young Christian, I was thrilled. I could not think of anything I would rather do than have a few minutes apart with Christ in an intimate camaraderie. Camarader, I can't even say comradeship. He promised, I will be here every, I'll be here every morning early. Meet with me here, and we will start the day together. So morning after morning, I would come downstairs to the drawing room, and he would take a book off the Bible from the bookcase. He would open it, and then we would read it together. He would tell me of its riches and unfold to me its truth. He would make my heart warm as he revealed his love and grace towards me. They were wonderful hours together. In fact, we called the dining room the withdrawing room. It was a period when we had our quiet time together. But little by little, under the pressure of many responsibilities, this time became to be shortened. Why, I don't know, but I thought I was just too busy to spend time with Christ. <laughs> this was not intentional, you understand. It, it just happened that way. Finally, not only was the time shortened, but I began to miss a day now and then. It was examination time at the university, then it was some other urgent emergency. I would miss it two days in a row and often more. I remember one morning when I was in a hurry, rushing down the steps, eager to be on my way. As I passed the drawing room, the door was ajar. Looking in, I saw a fireplace in the fireplace, a fire in the fireplace, and the Lord sitting there. Suddenly in dismay, I thought to myself, He's my guest. I have invited him into my heart. He had come as Lord of my home, and yet here I am neglecting him. I turned and went in. With downcast glance, I said, Blessed Master, forgive me. Have you been here all these mornings? Yes, he said. I told you I would be here every morning to meet with you. Then I was even more ashamed. He had been faithful in spite of my faithlessness. I asked his forgiveness, and he readily forgave me as he does when we are truly penitent. He said, the trouble with you is this. You have been thinking of quiet time, of the Bible study and prayer time as a factor of your own spiritual progress, but you have forgotten that this is this hour means something to me also. Remember, I love you. I have redeemed you at a great cost. I desire your fellowship. Now he said, do not neglect this hour if only for my sake. 
Whatever else may be your desire, remember I want your fellowship. You know, the truth that Christ wants my fellowship, that he loves me, wants me to be with him, wants to be with me and waits for me, has done more to transform my quiet time with God than any other single factor. Don't let Christ wait alone in the drawing room of your heart, but every day find some time when, with the word of God and in prayer, you may fellowship with him. Isaiah 55 verse says, Seek the Lord while you can find him. Call him now while he is near. Write a thought. The workshop. The workshop. Before long, he asked, Do you have a workshop in your home? Down in the basement of my home, of my heart, I had a workbench and some equipment, but I wasn't doing much with it. Once in a while, I would go down there and fuss around with a few little gadgets, but I wasn't producing anything worthwhile. I led him down there. He looked over the workbench and what little talents and skills I had. He said, this is a quiet, well-furnished what are you producing with your life for the kingdom of God? He looked at one or two of the little toys that I had thrown together on the bench, and he held one up to me. Are these little toys all that you are producing in your Christian life? Well, I said, Lord, that is the best I can do. I know it isn't much, and I really want to do more, but after all, I have no skill or strength. Mm. Would you like to do better, he asked. Certainly, I replied. All right, let me have your hands. Now relax in me and let my spirit work through you. I know you are unskilled and clumsy and awkward, but the spirit is the master worker and if he controls your hands and your heart he will work through you and so stepping around behind me and putting his great strong hands over mine mm -hmm. controlling the tools with his skillful fingers he began to work through me there is much more that I must still learn and I am very far from satisfied with the product that has been turned out. But I do know that whatever has been produced for God has been through his strong hand mm. and through the power of the spirit in, his, mm. in me. Do not become discouraged because you cannot do much for God. Your ability is not the fundamental condition. It is he who is controlling your fingers and upon whom you are relying. Give your talents and gifts to God and he will do things with them that will surprise you. James 2, 17 and 18 says, So you see, faith itself is not enough. Unless it produces good deeds, it is dead and useless. Now someone may argue, some people have faith, others have good deeds. But I say, how can you show me your faith if you don't have good deeds? Mm. I will show you my faith by my good deeds. <clears throat> the Playroom. I remember the time he inquired about the playroom. I was hoping he would not ask me about that. There are certain associations and friendships, activities and amuse amusements that I wanted to keep for myself. I did not think Christ would enjoy them or approve of them, so I evaded the question. But there came an evening when I was leaving to join some companions. I was in college at that time, and I was about to cross the threshold 
and he stopped me with a glance. Are you going out? I answered, yes. Good, he said, I would like to come with you. Oh, I replied awkwardly, I don't think, Lord, that you would really want to go with us. Let's go out tomorrow night. Tomorrow night we'll have a prayer meeting, but tonight I have another appointment. He said, all right. Oh, and I thought that I came in, when I came into your home, we're going out and do everything together. We're going to be partners. I want you to know that I am willing to go with you. Well, I said, we'll go someplace together, maybe tomorrow night. But that evening, I spent some miserable hours. I felt wretched. What kind of friend was I to Christ when I deliberately left him home? out of my associations, doing things and going places I knew very well he would not enjoy. When I returned that evening, there was a light in the room. And when I went up to talk it over with him, I said, Lord, I've learned my lesson. I cannot have a good time without you. We will do everything together from now on. Then he went down into the playroom of the house and there he transformed it. He brought into my life real joy, real happiness, real satisfaction, real friendships. Laughter and music became ringing in my house ever since. Romans 8, 39, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. the bedroom one day when we were in my bedroom he asked me about the picture next to my bed that's a picture of my girlfriend I told him although I knew my relationship with my girlfriend was a good one I felt funny talking with him about it she and I were struggling with some issues and I didn't want to discuss them with him I tried to change the subject but Jesus must have known what I was thinking you are beginning to question my teaching on sex, aren't you? That sexual relationships are only for those who are joined in a covenant of marriage. You're feeling that I may be asking something unnatural, if not impossible. You're afraid my will on this will limit the full enjoyment of life and love. Isn't that true? Yes, I confess. Then listen carefully to what I am saying, He's, he continued. I forbid adultery and premarital sex, not because sex is bad, but because it is good. Beyond the physical ecstasy that it is, it's a means of bonding two lives and deepening love. It has creative power to bring human life into being. Sex is powerful. Used properly, sex has tremendous potential for good. Used improperly, it destroys the good. For this reason, God intends it to be expressed only within the commitment of a loving life relationship. There's far more love than just sex. Let me help you in your relationships with the opposite sex. If you should fail and feel shame and guilt, and, and feel shame and guilt, know that I will still love you and I will still remain in you. Talk to me about it. Acknowledge the wrong. Take steps to avoid it from happening again. Rely on my strength to keep you from falling and to lead you into a relationship of love in marriage where two truly become one. John 8, 10 and 11. Then Jesus stood up again and said to the adulterous woman, where are your accusers? Didn't even one of them condemn you? No, Lord, she said. And Jesus said, neither do I. Go and sin no more. The hall closet. There is just one more matter that I might share with you. One day I found him waiting for me at the door. There was an arresting look in his eye. He said to me as I entered, there is a peculiar odor in the house. 
There is something dead around here. It's upstairs. I think it's in the hall closet. As soon as he said the words, I knew what he was talking about. Yes, there was a small hall closet behind lock and key. I had one or two little personal things that I did not want anybody to know about, and certainly I did not want Christ to see. I knew they were dead and rotting things, and yet I loved them, and I wanted them so for myself that I was afraid to admit that they were there. I went up the stairs with him, and as we mounted, the odor became stronger and stronger. He pointed it at the door and said, It's in there, some dead thing. I was angry. That's the only way I could put it. I had given him access to the library, the dining room, the drawing room, the workshop, the playroom, and now he was asking me about a little two by four closet. I said inwardly, this is too much. I'm not gonna give him the key. Well, he said, reading my thoughts, if you think I'm going to stay up here on the second floor with this odor, you are mistaken. I will take my bed out on the back porch. I am certainly not going to put up with that. And I saw him start down the stairs. When you have come to know and love Christ, the worst thing that can happen to you is to sense his fellowship retreating from you. I had to surrender. I'll give you the key, I said sadly, but you'll have to open the closet. You'll have to clean it out. I haven't the strength to do it. I know, he said, I know you haven't. Just give me the key. Just authorize me to take care of that closet and I will. So with trembling fingers, I passed the key over to him. He took it from my hand, walked over to the door, opened it, entered it, took out all the putrefying stuff that was rotting there and threw it away. Then he cleansed the closet, painted it, fixed it up, doing it all in a moment's time. Oh, what victory and release to have that dead thing out of my life. 1 John 1, 8 through 10. If we claim we have no sin, we are only fooling ourselves and not living in the truth. But if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all wickedness. If we claim we have not sinned, we are calling God a liar and showing that his word has no place in our heart. Transferring to title. Then a thought came to me. I said to myself, I've been trying to keep this heart of mine clear for Christ. I started on one room, and no sooner I've cleaned that room than the other room is dirty. I begin on the second room, and the first room becomes dusty again. I'm so tired and weary of trying to maintain a clean heart and a beating life. I just want to give up so I ventured a question Lord is there any chance that you would take over the responsibility of the whole house and operate it for me and with me just as you did that closet would you take the responsibility to keep my heart what it ought to be and my life where it ought to be I could see his face lighten up as he replied certainly that is what I came to do you cannot be victor a victorious Christian in your own strength. It is impossible. Let me do it through you and for you. That is the way. But he added slowly, I'm not the owner of the house. I'm just a guest. I have no authority to proceed since the property is not mine. I saw it in a minute and dropping to my knees, I said, Lord, you have been my guests and I've been the host. From now on, I'm going to be the servant. You're going to be my Lord. Run, running as fast as I could to the strong box, 
I took the title deed of the house, describing its assets, its liabilities, its situations and condition. Then turning to him, I eagerly signed it over to him. Belong, everything belonged to him alone for time and eternity. Here I said, here it is, all that I am, all that I have forever. Now you run the house. I'll just remain as your houseboy and friend. He took my life that day. And I gave him my word that there's no better way to live as a Christian. He knows how to keep it in shape and how to deeply settle into the depths of my soul. May Christ settle down and be at home in your heart as Lord of all. Second Corinthians 5, 17 and 18 says, anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person, the old life is gone. A new life has begun. And all of this is a gift from God who brought this back to himself through Christ. And God has given us the task of reconciling people to him. Our mission statement of our church is to reach and teach the unsaved, to love God and to love others. As we prepared, and thank you, Pastor Thane and Heidi and Lilia for, for sharing this heart. I know some of this is a little bit tough to listen to, but God knows. He wants the purity of heart. He wants your, your heart to be his home. He wants to control everything. Amen? Amen? And when we do, you'll live a life that is honoring of God, and you will be blessed from here to eternity. So as we, as we break into a small groups, okay? Facilitator says, I assign you to different groups. So I want you to have um, facilitators just to give people time to really process. And to be honest, and remember this, it's a spirit of confidentiality as you pray for one another because we've all messed up. Amen? Amen. Gabe, um, Pastor John, would you go back there with... Uh